Good day, everyone. On behalf of Cambridge Health Tech Institute's Global Web Symposia series and our sponsor, Twist Biopharma, a division of Twist Bioscience, I'd like to welcome you to high throughput antibody screening using next generation synthetic antibody libraries coupled with kinetic and binning assays. My name is Elizabeth Lamb, and I'm the host and moderator for today's event. Now, I'd like to introduce our presenters for today. First is Dr. Erin K. Sato, PhD, Chief Scientific Officer, Biopharma, with TWIST Biopharma, a division of TWIST Bioscience. Our second speaker is Dr. Daniel H. Bettinger, PhD, Application Science Team Lead with Cartera. Welcome, Erin. The presenter ball is yours. Great. Thanks so much, Elizabeth, for the introduction. So again, my name is Aaron Sutter. I'm the CSO of the Biopharma Vertical at Twist Bioscience. And today I'm going to give you an overview of the Twist Biopharma libraries and how we use kinetic and binning assays as part of our overall workflow using the Cartera LSA system. And then I'll pass the ball to Dan, who will give you a, a much better overview of the system and how, it's, how it generally can be used throughout the biopharma industry. So again, I always say the, the best companies out there really understand the best, the one thing that they're really good at. And so for Twist, that's actually our ability to print DNA. So shown on the right is this uh, silicon chip platform that we have where we can actually print up to a million individual oligos up to 300 base pairs in length on this device. And basically, it's a, it's a fantastic way to make individual oligo pools. So we can make pools of oligos anywhere from 10 oligos all the way up to a million. And we can use those oligos to make all kinds of different uh, custom DNA products. So our top custom product that we make is, of course, clonal genes, where you can, make, you can order any clonal gene up to 5 kb in length, and we can clone that into any vector you wish. But there are all kinds of other products that we make as well. Uh, we use um, alga pools themselves for, say, gene editing, CRISPR-Cas9 applications. We also use um, alga pools for our NGS enrichment kit line to actually enrich for specific sequences before doing NGS. And then finally, we use the alga pools to build um, high quality DNA libraries. And again, the, the custom DNA libraries are actually really central to the TWIST biopharma mission, which I'll get into in a second. So how do we use alga pools to generate and build um, DNA libraries, and in particular, antibody libraries? Um, so if you think of an antibody variable domain, either a heavy chain or a light chain domain, is essentially uh, three, a collection of three different loops that are uh, pieced together. You could think of basically uh, uh, synthesizing an oligopole that encodes for diversity in each of those different loops, and then basically um, uh, seamlessly PCR them together to create a hypervariable domain. I know this is subtle, but it, uh, one kind of the reason why this is, in my mind, kind of game changing in the antibody engineering and discovery space is that in the past, when people have made synthetic libraries, they typically use what's called the degenerate oligo, which is an oligo that has uh, mixtures of nucleotides or mixtures of trinucleotides. And you basically try to use that oligo to mimic the diversity that's seen in the natural human repertoire as you build an antibody phage split library. In this case, I don't need to do that. Um, I can actually make explicit sequences in a pool and then just shuffle them in different contexts within the uh, context of a single human germline framework. So this allows me to make libraries that are much more precise and also that exactly match the natural human antibody repertoire if I choose to. In addition, um, I can also remove sequences up front that might lead to um, developability risks. So isomerization sites, cleavage sites, gambation, like oscillation sites, for example. And then finally, um, if, I, if, if I choose to, I can also code for specific motifs um, in our uh, CDR sequences as well. And that's actually uh, really important for our GPCR libraries, which I'm not going to talk about today, but if you're interested, please again follow up with me. So again, just to reiterate the, the power of the TWIST platform to make libraries, again, we use this uh, silicon-based DNA synthesis platform to make huge pools of algos, and we can use those pools of algos to make really precise antibody uh, uh, DNA libraries, and in particular, uh, antibody phages for libraries. We have really strict uh, codon usage control, and we can control the combinatorial diversity of these, of the combinations of those different alga pools in the construction of the library. We have tight control over the amino acid distribution in each position, 
And because we're just making um, pools of individual algos, uh, we can actually, it's very easy to, to modify and have different lengths of CDRs, which again, using the traditional ways of using degenerate algos, it's actually really difficult to do and you require multiple uh, degenerate algos. Of course, we can, we can avoid restriction sites and unwanted motifs potentially use uh, multiple germline frameworks. And that the finally, last but not least, you can also validate the library at the end using next generation sequencing to make sure that the final library matches the design uh, that we intended. So what is the twist biopharma vertical within twist bioscience? Um, we're basically an antibody discovery and optimization group that utilizes all the fantastic DNA products within twist to uh, help pharma and biotech discover as well as optimize antibodies. And we basically have two kind of flavors of antibody libraries. The first one are just kind of general use libraries that are either based off of FAB, single chain FE, or VHH scaffolds. I'm going to talk today about the VHH libraries and how we use them to discover novel antibodies. But we also have a whole series of libraries that can be used for difficult to drug targets. I'm not going to talk about today our primary difficult to drug class of targets are our GPCR libraries, which we actually have two. And we're again, we're continuing to innovate in this space to create libraries against ion channels and other things like carbohydrates as well. Thirdly, um, we have a whole platform for doing antibody optimization. I will also talk about this today as it relates to doing uh, affinity ranking and binning. So again, a fantastic system that we have in-house for doing affinity maturation and humanization of antibodies. And then finally, I'll also mention our new alpha product, which is our ability to do high throughput antibody production. It's part of every project we do within the twist biopharma vertical, um, but it's also a product that we're thinking about rolling out to the greater twist um, customer base. And so um, please stay tuned for that uh, update. So again, thinking of ways that we are differentiated from other um, antibody discovery companies out there, um, one way that I think that we're very special is that Oftentimes in the phage display arena, you're limited by the overall diversity of your library. For a phage library, that's typically around 10 billion. So if you want to increase the breadth of your diversity, rather than just building a bigger and bigger library, um, one way is actually to build more libraries. So my solution to this is because Twist can build high quality libraries so quickly, um, why not have at one, one point in the near future, you know, a whole plate of libraries where we have basically 100 libraries of 10 to the 10th. So overall, we would have a total diversity of roughly you know, 10 to the 12th. So that gives us a huge breadth of different scaffolds, um, different diversities and CDR loops that allows us to, be, at the end of the day, be successful in any target that comes our way. And so I've coined the term a library of libraries that Twist Biopharma is offering. Okay, so getting into that library of libraries. Um, so again, as I said, we have general use libraries that can be used for any uh, target that have different types of scaffolds. So on the top right, we have a, our libraries that we call the Hypermoon Library, which is a fully human fab library. It has a very large oligo pool at heavy chain CDR3 that encodes for over 2.5 million uh, individual heavy chain CDR3 sequences derived from the natural human repertoire. This is a fab library, and we've also made um, a light chain, a common light chain version of that same library to enable you to make uh, common light chain by specifics. On the top left are VHH libraries. I'm gonna talk a lot more about these later on, but we basically have four different um, VHH single domain libraries for use. On the bottom right, we have a library that we call the Structural Antibody Library. It's a, it's a library based off of all of the known antibody crystal structures that are in the PDB. Uh, we made the assumption that if an antibody has a crystal structure, it's uh, usually very well behaved potentially very developable. So we took that as an input data set to create a fully human antibody SCFV library focused on um, using that uh, diversity set. And then, as I said, another big area for us is, is, to, is our focus on difficult to direct targets. And again, we started with GPCRs where we created two different libraries, our, our motif directed library that we call GPCR 2.0, and also another library that we call GPCR 3.0 that's based off of all the known um, GPCR antibodies that have ever been discovered. And again, those are two fantastic libraries for potentially directing them against uh, any difficult GPCR target that you might have. And then finally, as I mentioned, we are innovating and continue to innovate in the space and are now working on um, and have libraries now for direct against ion channels as well as carbohydrates. 
I'll just, again, introduce the idea of our high throughput IgG service. It's our new alpha product. Uh, as I said, it's it, in, a part of every project that we do. And it's another project that a product that I'm trying to push out within Twist to, again, the, the idea is to not only offer up the genes that encode for specific antibodies, which again, a lot of people use us to synthesize for them. Why not also offer up the ability to actually make um, large numbers, but small amounts of antibody as well, just like we do on the, on the DNA side for genes. And so I've actually created now with the team inside Twist to actually create a whole workflow around making clonal genes, um, doing mini preps, and then doing transient transfections and hexane and three, and then doing downstream purification to purify large numbers of IgGs. And we can do that on a one mil as well as an eight mil scale to deliver either hundreds of micrograms or maybe even upwards of a milligram of antibody to you. So again, as I said, this is part of uh, all the projects that we do and we want to roll this out as a new product um, down the road. And we can do that for both full length antibodies as well as VHHFC. So basically any kind of structure that has a FC domain that would use protein A to purify. Okay, so now I'll transition into the, into the use of our libraries and how we use affinity ranking and binning as part of our process. So again, as I said, um, VHH libraries are important uh, repertoire of our library of libraries. Um, I really love single domains because they're small and modular. They're, they can uh, get into epitopes and crevices that are oftentimes hindered by larger IgGs. And of course, as everybody knows, they're great building blocks for bispecifics as well. And also because they're smaller, they're really easy to make and manufacture. And so in my mind, they're a great alternative to a traditional IgG structure. So what kind of libraries do we have at Twist Biopharma to actually enable you to discover a VHH against your target? So we actually have four different libraries. The first three are shown here. Again, we, had a, we found a very large um, LAMA uh, database. It actually had over 3,000 VHHs that had bound to a specific um, target. And so we took those input 3000 VHHs and used them to design the four libraries I'll talk about now. The first one is what we call the VHH ratio library. Basically, we create basically created all the pools that encode for the diversity seen in each of the different CDR loops um, out from the database. So again, we create all the pools that kind of mimic what a degenerate algo would do, but in a very controlled way. And then we um, which you utilize the diversity shown um, in the first um, schematic for this library. We then put them into a consensus LAMA framework and then finally created the, the, v, the final VHH ratio library that's shown here. And we also added in a fair amount of length diversity in CDR3 as well. For the next two libraries, um, we, didn't, uh, we didn't do that. We basically just used exact CDR sequences derived from those 3000 LAMA uh, VHHs and just shuffle them in unique contexts, either in the, in the context of a consensus LAMA framework, for the VHH shuffle library, or a humanized uh, LAMA framework, which is the VHH H shuffle library. And so again, yeah, it's really akin to, for example, doing chain shuffling um, back in the day, again, which is again innovated by Cambridge Antibody Technology. But in this case, I'm doing CDR shuffling in the context of a single framework. So that allows me to get unique specificities and binding that I might not be able to get with the original antibody that they're derived from. Now, all these libraries are transformed on a level of 10 billion different numbers, um, as I said before. And then finally, we created a fourth library. Um, I'm no, I don't have any data in it about this library today, but I'm surprised to say it's also a fantastic VHH library we've seen a lot of great results from, which is basically we take the last library, which is the VHH 8 shuffle library, and we replaced on the LAMA CDR3 diversity with the hyperimmune heavy chain CDR3 diversity I talked about before, which again is an algal pool over 2.5 million heavy chain CDR3s. I mean, so we put that into the CDR3 register of the library. So it's, it's kind of a hybrid structure of LAMA diversity in CDR1 with uh, human diversity in CDR3. And again, in a, in a humanized uh, Tratstuzumab VHH framework. And shown here is just a, a schematic of the different length diversities. You can see for the ratio library, you know, you see a, a broad range of different lengths. Um, in the middle, you see the CDR3 diversity for the uh, H shuffle and also the shuffle library. And you can see the, again, the natural distribution of lengths for the, 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 the LAMA uh, VHHs in our database. And you can see anywhere from very short all the way to very long CDR3s. And then again, on the far right is just the natural human diversity that's in the hypermune library that was also inserted into the last library I just talked about. 
And so when we pan those libraries, we basically take each of the individual libraries, and oftentimes we'll even pull them all together um, and pan them against any, any protein target we wish. We do typ typically we do phage ELISA um, at rounds four and five, sequence all of our clones. And then as because we sit inside of a, a, a DNA company, we can very easily reformat and use the uh, high throughput IgG, in this case, VHHFC process that I talked about before to make large numbers of individual and purified VHHFCs. And then we run them through our um, Cartera LSA platform that I'll talk about in a second to determine affinities of those interactions, as well as look at epitope binning um, of those different binders and how to interact with each other. And also we run them through a whole panel of developability assays as well. So um, shown here is just an example where we did this with a target called TIGIT, which is an amino oncology target. As I said, we typically do about four or five rounds of panning. Shown here is where we actually did four. And you can see for the first three libraries I talked about, we see dramatic uh, improvement and enrichment of specific phage clones uh, as we go to successive rounds. So again, showing that um, we get good enrichment of clones and that the selection potentially is working. When we then pick colonies from each of those um, different rounds, so rounds three, four, and five from all three libraries, we then did phagelizers against um, each of those different rounds, and then took all of our unique clones and sequenced them. Um, shown here in the table on the top is the number of unique clones from each of the different libraries from all those successive rounds of screening. Uh, we've also shown the bottom, the CDR length distribution from all three libraries for all of the unique clones. And what you can see is that the CDR3 length diversity is actually very different between all the different libraries, again, showing that we're getting different sequences out, different types of potential binders. And so, again, having a breadth of libraries allows us to potentially find uh, a breadth of different epitopes against this specific target, which we'll bear out later when we talk about epitope binning. Um, as I said, we, we love the Cartera in terms of its ability to do a, a, a one-to-many type of binding analysis. So that allows us to, in this case, since we have hundreds um, of, anab of VHHFCs to immobilize them on the surface. And again, Dan, we'll get into much more uh, detail about how the system works uh, after I talk. But basically, we can put down a whole um, hundreds of different um, proteins on the surface in a very short period of time, get kinetic data on all of them. And so again, that's a first pass that allows us to rank them in terms of their overall affinities. And so for this entire project, we, as I said, we had over 100 different um, VHHFCs. And we saw a range of affinities anywhere from double digit nanomolar all the way to um, micromolar range. And again, we also look for specificity. Um, shown here is just again some more clones against another target that we also panned on separately. But this uh, slide is again just showing non whether the clones are specific in the sense that we want to make sure that. Um, our TIGIT specific clones are actually um, specific for TIGIT and don't bind any other targets. So again, the Cartero system is fantastic for once you've laid down your specific clones on the array, you can use very easily look at specificity to uh, not only um, irrelevant proteins, but also to closely related family members like other species, for example, to look at affinity data against those other forms of the target as well. And then again, we can, uh, we get, it's because it's an S SPR instrument, we get nice um, KA and K, little KD data. Um, and that allows us again to look to see how they're, um, and we can plot them on this ISO affinity plot to see how they are uh, been into different affinity groups and how they're, whether they're driven primarily by off rate or on rate uh, in terms of that overall big KD. And then when we look further into um, and bend them against into different affinity bins, we can see that, uh, and then actually sort them based on the library that they're from. You can see that in general, we're, get, we're seeing you know, high affinity binding from all three libraries. So in the graph on the right, we've actually color coded it by the, the three libraries I talked about in terms of the affinity bins that they're derived from. And so in general, we see a, a nice distribution again from double digit to micromolar affinity. Um, there is a slight trend that the highest affinity clones came from the VHH H shuffle library. And if you look on the left, we've actually ranked all the clones from highest affinity to lowest affinity, from double digit to 100, 100 nanomolar. And you can see in general, you see an, a nice distribution of all three libraries. But as I said, the, the top clones did come from the VHH human shuffle library. And another analysis we'd love to do is to do a um, uh, phylogenetic wheel of the sequences and how they're related to one another by their primary amino acid sequence. And then we like love to layer on the um, Cartera affinity data on top of that, as well as like, other expressibility data. So 
Um, shown in green on the outside of the wheel, we actually plotted one over the KD. So you can really see if, you, if it's a really high bar, that's a high affinity clone. And so you can, you can see how the highest affinity clones are clustered into different um, amino acid families um, within all of the sequences that we discovered. And then finally, we did a, a full epitope binning to understand how the, how the clones from all three libraries um, fell into different communities in terms of how they might compete with, how they compete with one another. And as you can see, and again, they're, they're color coded based on library, you know, the, the certain libraries favored specific communities uh, within the I, this, uh, competition binning plot. And so you can really see again that the power of having the library of libraries and having multiple libraries at your disposal allows you to access other communities that may be excluded by other specific um, frameworks and diversities. Um, as I mentioned, we also um, and then followed up and did um, competition experiments to see, and this is just, again, just a, an ELISA-based assay, but the reason why I bring it up is because I, it actually uh, relates back to the community data I just showed in the sense that the, the highest affinity clones that actually competed the best um, in this competition assay with the known ligand for TIGIT, which is CD155, all came from um, uh, the, the community, but mostly came from the community one. So again, we can see how um, the epitope um, actually relates to the actual um, functional readout from the competition assay. So again, really showing the power of doing um, high throughput and large scale epitope binning and how it can relate back to the uh, functional readout like competition in this case. And in addition to doing all the fantastic uh, assays for affinity and epitope binning, we also run our uh, VHHs through a whole panel of different developability assays for purity on our lab chip system, um, as well as we look for overall stability um, using our uh, Unchained Uncle system. And so we can get a, a good sense of overall expression, developability, and stability. And again, we couple that with all the fantastic data derived from the Cartera system. Um, now I'll just end with our tau platform. So like, as I said, our tau platform is our ability to optimize antibodies. And again, what we, what we have for um, that system is we have a custom software that has a very large human and GS database as part of it. And again, we use that to basically um, input an antibody sequence into it. And the, the software basically looks at the specific sequence um, and suggests, I mean, uh, all goes to make that are within a defined mutational space derived from that human antibody repertoire. That and, and actually allows us to then build a library focused on your specific lead. And so this is just, again, how it works. Um, we uh, put in your antibody, which can, can be derived from any source into the software. It, the software suggests a whole series of all the pools to make, we synthesize them, create an antibody phage display library. And then from that, we can, um, again, pan and screen it against your original target. And, and oftentimes we see a dramatic increase in affinity shown here is just one example where we increase the affinity of a PD-1 antibody by 70. And again, showing you uh, data from the Cartera system, where again, you can see um, for hundreds of antibody variants of this original parental antibody, which is shown on the right in green, you can see again, dramatic improvement in affinity. And again, this, since this is PD-1, we also ran um, the market improved antibodies against PD-1, which are pembrolizumab and nivolumab. And again, we see comparable affinities to, to those, those two uh, market improved PD-1 antibodies. We've also gone on to do a full epitope bin with these antibodies. I mean, as expected, since they're some pretty maturation and they're derived from a parent, um, they all should bind in, in the same bin. And in general, that's what we see. So again, it's just a nice test. Um, it's very easy to do in the Cartera, um, but again, just making sure that we didn't get epitope drift um, during the optimization. And again, I'll just conclu conclude. In ways to work with Twist Biopharma, again, we're open to licensing libraries, in particular the VHH libraries I talked about today, um, as well as doing partnerships around all of those different libraries, um, not only for discovery work, but also for the optimization. We do generate a lot of leads derived from all the POCs that we do around the libraries, and we're definitely open to licensing those. We do a lot of work with our library counterparts, the library team internally, where we do help um, virtual companies to they, where they design their own libraries and we actually help out with the, over the downstream screening of those libraries. So that's oftentimes a project that we do. And then, as I said, we're trying to kick off a new alpha product for high throughput IgG. And so if anybody's interested in uh, accessing that new alpha program, please follow up with me. Okay, and then I'll, again, I'll pass the ball over to Dan, who will give you a fantastic overview of the um, Cartera LSA system. And, 
uh, much more detail than I did. And we'll kind of, I think, open up the hood a little bit and show you kind of how it works and how to, uh, how to really access all the fantastic capabilities of the system. We at Cartera really view the LSA as a disruption in the capacity to do antibody characterization, especially at the early stages of screening. Um, you know, MABs are obviously being leveraged by drug discovery for their high specificity and affinity. And the binding kinetics, the affinity, and the epitopes that those antibodies recognize are really the crucial parameters uh, that inform the mechanism of action. And SPR has, for a long time, really been the de facto technique that people rely on for measuring those binding kinetics and affinity. So the LSA really just takes all of that existing knowledge and techniques and tries to expand the capacity by you know, roughly an order of magnitude, which should enable customers to generate uh, more data earlier in their funnel uh, for more of their clone. And uh, 384 ligand capacity of the LSA, which is how many antibodies we can immobilize on the surface of the array at a time, really enables a new scale in high throughput epitope binning study that enable uh, exquisite epitope resolution. And really the architecture of the system makes it such that the sample consumption is very minimal and it's relatively easy to set up these large experiments. The format of the plates and things are very simple. Also, we've put a huge amount of effort into making a dedicated kinetic and epitope analysis software packages that really facilitate uh, dealing with these large data, data sets in an information rich and uh, easy to use kind of way. So, the LSA's core applications are really designed around some of the, the fundamentals of antibody screening workflows, those being kinetics and affinity analysis, epitope binning. Uh, epitope mapping and quantitation. And as I mentioned, you know, we really put a huge amount of effort into making these uh, visually uh, rewarding and interesting presentations of the data in these kinetics and epitope software packages. And I'll talk a bit more about that later on. So this is a picture of the LSA. It's a benchtop and SPR instrument. It's quite large. We prefer to sell it with a table that it sits on that holds the you know, the waste and the computer and supplies underneath it. The real differentiating factor about the LSA, though, is this two relatively independent fluidic modules that control how the samples get to the system. So there's a 96 channel mode and a single channel mode, and both offer bidirectional flow of analyte, which is reduces sample consumption. Um, and using the 96 channel mode, you can immobilize up to 384 antibodies at an array. Um, so we're going to watch a little video here that shows how the system works. So this is the 96 needle manifold for the, the 96 channel fluidic side of the system. Uh, this shows the 96 flow cells coming down and being created on the chip surface and flowing the sample back and forth. It's the ability to do this is really Cartera's probably biggest differentiator. We can flow 96 samples at a time in a bi-directional way across the chip surface. So this allows you to overcome conventional limitations on uh, flow rate and contact time. Also, it, it's really a new approach to creating arrays. The traditional microarray deposition is just deposition-based, where you're putting material uh, onto the surface in an additive fashion, whereas we are doing this under full flow. So it goes from running buffer to sample, then back to running buffer. So you can do things that you would do on conventional biosensors, like um, the mobilization of low concentration proteins using electrostatic pre-concentration or capture of uh, crude samples using an affinity. Um, also important, and I think you can run this one more time, is that the system will return the sample to the plate after it deposits it. So from that 200 microliter volume, you not only get efficient array capture, but you can get the sample back for further analysis or reuse. So once you've created a 96 array, 
the system can go get more samples and dock to a different position and print additional 96 arrays, up to four of them, creating uh, the high density 384 spot array seen in this image. So the other fluidic module, so the 96 channel manifold can move away and then uh, the single channel manifold can come over and dock and create a single flow cell. So this exposes one sample over the entire surface of the array. This can be used for activation or creating a capture affinity lawn. You're going to capture crude samples. Then once you've created your array, you can flow one sample over the entire array. So this would be, say, a concentration of antigen if you're doing kinetics or a competitor antibody if you're doing epitope binning and you collect simultaneously data from that one 250 microliter sample uh, in, in real time for all of the antibodies you've immobilized. So this, this is a schematic of how the arrays are created. So the 96 channel manifold is shown um, on the top with the pink vertical rectangles being individual flow cells. The blue rectangles are the interspot references. And then when you do four nested 96 well immobilizations or capture steps, you end up with the 384 array um, as shown below, essentially in the same footprint as the 96. Um, and then you can flow one sample over the entire thing and collect all 432 data streams, 384 active, 48 references uh, in a single injection. So, at Cartera, we like to think it's all about the epitope. So the, one of the main things is if you can characterize your epitope diversity of your panel early on, it can be a surrogate for functional diversity. If you were to run a, let's say, a panning and screen the output and you see that you see very low epitope diversity, it probably means that you have low functional diversity as well in terms of mechanisms of actions and, and you know, broad coverage of your antigen. Um, so it's a good check for that. Also, this epitope influences the antibody's mechanism of action. You know, whether the antibody is an agonist, uh, an antagonist, uh, forces neutralization, uh, internalization, those are all largely dependent on the epitope the antibodies recognize. Also, this epitope property is innate. Um, it can't be really predicted by in silico methods ahead of time. Uh, nor can you really rationally retarget it by, by engineering. So you really have to select antibodies to the epitopes you're interested in up front. Um, epitope binning can be used to secure IP. At least traditionally, a lot of claims around antibodies are based on their competition profiles with other competitors. And if you have a high-resolution epitope competition map, uh, it can be easy to find differences or find things that can uh, differentiate or clone or demonstrate uh, you know, against prior art. And also, if you have antibodies that bind to different epitopes on the receptor, uh, you can have, especially if you have, like, say, viral neutralizers that bind to multiple epitopes, and you can have those antibodies co-occupy the target, it dramatically increases their potency. So competition-based epitope binning is only one way to characterize epitopes on the LSA. It's probably the one most commonly applied, um, but we, can, we have two formats for that we use, one we call classical binning, which is the ideal method if you're looking at monovalent antigens where antibodies will not self-sandwich. If your antibody is a, a dimer or trimer uh, multimeric species, then you would use the premix approach. And that's where you premix the antigen with the competitor antibody and inject it over the surface to look for an increase or decrease in the amount of that antigen binding. Um, we also have applications around peptide mapping or epitope mapping. This is where you would use a series of overlapping biotinylated peptides and immobilize them onto the array and see uh, which antibodies bind to which peptides. So you can get a focused a read of the epitope, assuming the antibodies can bind to a peptide. Um, the epitope software package has a module for making this analysis really intuitive. Also, a very similar approach can be done um, with full-length protein if you do make mutants 
Uh, so these can be chimeras or alanine scans, for example, um, where you immobilize your diversity of antigen mutants and then see which antibodies bind to which mutants. You can also use that to identify key residues and regions of the, uh, of the epitope or the antigen that are important for binding. So high throughput binning on the LSA is really a big step forward in that conventional epitope binning runs will scale geometrically with the number of clones. So it's sort of an exponential function in the amount of antibody you need and the amount of antigen you need to run those experiments and the amount of time required. But the LSA's architecture allows you to have uh, essentially a non-scaling assay in terms of the amount of antibody you need to run it. So it, it doesn't matter whether you're doing a 10 by 10 or a 384 by 384, the amount of antibody you need of each clone doesn't change. It's going to be in this 5 to 15 micrograms range, depending on the assay parameters. Um, you need one volume of sample as a ligand to immobilize and one volume of sample to use as the competitor. So typically that's going to take between 30 to 50 micrograms of antigen for a 96 analyte run um, and you know, up to about 200 for a 384 by 384, which will give you 147,000 interactions over the And here's a, a published example of a 384 by 384 epitope binning. So these data sets, as I mentioned, are large. You know, you can have up to 147,000 interactions to look at. Um, and the, it's fairly complex. So Cartera has spent a lot of time on our epitope analysis software, trying to make it uh, very intuitive and flexible and also provide you some really great visualizations. So this is actually a view from the software as you'd be doing an analysis. So on the left-hand side, you have a sensorgram view. Here you can see the antigen injection followed by the injection of either buffer in the dark blue or uh, sandwiching or competing antibodies. Um, you can set uh, the green bar as a normalization bar where you uh, equilibrate to or normalize all of the samples to how much antigen bound. And then the second orange bar is your report point that populates this heat map plot. You can see there's a cutoff where you have a red region which is blocking and a green region which is sandwiching for those injections. So I, I chose this example of this clone because you can see even though it has significant dissociation from the surface, um, you're still able to get clear uh, sandwiching information for that clone. So the information from the sensorgram plot with these cutoffs is then displayed on this heat map plot. So we have the immobilized antibodies in the Y direction and the injected antibodies in the X direction. And green means it's a sandwicher, non-competitor. Red means it's a blocker and the black, versus, black uh, outline is self versus self. And then once you've ha generated this heat map and the software sorted it, you can create a network plot. And each antibody in your set is shown as a node or a circle. A cord or a line connecting two nodes means that they're competitive with each other. A lack of a line means they're sandwiching. And then if they're contained within one of these colored regions, those are our epitope bins. That means all of the clones in that group have the exact same competition profile in the assay. And what's really unique about this software is that these three panels are interactive. So if you were to say click on a cord in the network plot, it would highlight the cells of the heat map that are used to make that call and then display you the sensorgrams on the panel. So this makes really digging into the, the data in a lot of detail and in fine granularity very easy. You know, other platforms, you may have to go from a table in one module to a visualization in another, and then the raw data in the third. This has everything at your fingertips, both raw and normalized data. So the exploration of these bins is also a bit flexible. So if you end up with a network plot where only identical clones in terms of competition profile are shown in a bin, the software will also generate a dendrogram, which shows how the competition profiles differ among related clones. And you can set a cutoff and generate what we call a community plot. And so this is a more generalized view that the user defines what level of resolution they want 
in the analysis. So talk briefly about how this type of analysis applies to synthetic libraries. So as Aaron covered this really well, you, know, you can design your diversity in silico. So you have a very controlled and focused you know, construct of your library. If you're twist and have the ability to synthesize huge amounts of DNA, you can do that in an easy fashion and then assemble and express these large libraries, or yes, now even a library of libraries. Um, you can pan them against your target, sequence and the output from that panning, and express your unique clones, at which point we you can characterize them based on affinity and epitope thinning. So these synthetic antibody libraries have huge diversity, and, and it's highly effective diversity too because it's so controlled. Um, but when you get sequence diversity out of a panning, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have a functional diversity. It's really the high throughput epitope thinning analysis that is going to give you your clearest picture on how diverse in terms of number of epitopes and coverage of that antigen your output and your panning really was. You know, various say, protein antigens can have uh, denatured epitopes that may cause an epitope bias in a selection and how the panning's run, et cetera. So it's good to be able to verify that you are getting a broad epitope coverage early on. Also, when you have uh, these carefully constructed diversity in these libraries and you do pannings, you can end up with output where it, with related gene families or, or antibody sequences. Oftentimes, if you have lots of kinetic information as well as epitope information, you can go and look at those sequences and learn a lot about the contribution to the binding of the various amino acids. So moving on to a hot topic nowadays is the use of uh, neutralizing antibodies to viral and pathogen targets. So, Cartera has multiple customers that are using the LSA to characterize the anti-SARS-CoV-2 antibodies um, from a variety of, of sources. Um, this is really an example of how multi-clone cocktails uh, of neutralizing antibodies can be synergistic to make these therapeutics. Uh, you know, the COVID spike protein is very large and has the opportunity to have multiple neutralizing epitopes on that. And much like the antibody's immune response, if you want to have a potent neutralizing therapy, um, you're going to want to take uh, things that block, say, H2 receptor uh, action from different non-competitive epitopes. And when you pool those antibodies together, um, past experience has shown that you'll have a much more potent antibody. Um, they can be highly synergistic. So to be able to generate rapidly one of these uh, monoclonal antibody neutralizing cocktails, it's really important to be able to do early and rapid characterization of both binding specificity, uh, the kinetics profiling, and the epitope diversity so that you can focus your uh, more involved functional and in vivo assays on very directed. Um, so the LSA can perform all these analysis on up to 384 clones in parallel, making the use of your time and antigen very efficient. And also, I just want to mention that Cartera is involved in the COVID consortium. So we volunteered to help, which is run by the La Jolla Institute for Immunotherapy. So they are um, compiling antibodies from industry and academia and going to have a centralized processing to f try to find the most efficacious ones to make one of these antibody cocktails and uh, Cartera is going to be involved in that effort. Um, this is an example of this type of analysis that was done on uh, patient-derived antibodies that were exposed to the yellow fever vaccine. So they did um, isolated B cell sequence cloning um, for uh, two patients over a period of time as they were immunized and looked at the epitope diversity and antibody sequence diversity and where the neutralizing antibodies came from. And this was an interesting experiment that we were able to find uh, neutralizing antibodies to a number of epitopes. Several of the epitopes, one more common from the 
upper left corner and then one a little bit further to the right, uh, where there was a high incidence of highly potent neutralizers, and they were in distinct and non-overlapping epitopes. So one, this data merging the neutralization data and the epitope binning data really gave us a good picture of the, the functional space uh, on the antigen of where these antibodies can bind and act, but also was highly suggestive of a good potential cocktail of antibodies that would be synergistic together. So I'm going to dive a little bit into kinetic analysis on the LSA. So this is an example of a typical antibody screening workflow where we have an anti-human SC lawn created. We can then capture up to 384 antibodies, either from supernatants or um, from diluted purified samples, and then we inject a titration series of antigen. Uh, this allows for up to screening 384 antibodies in parallel, and the LSA has three 384 well plate positions, so you can automate up to a 1152 MAB screen in this format. So this is what we think high throughput kinetics should look like. This is 384 interactions um, from one run, which was set up in an afternoon and run into the evening. Uh, it's a detailed kinetic characterization in that it has eight concentrations of antigen um, used. But because this was done in parallel, it was only really one injection of each concentration and used seven micrograms of, this was PD-1, so 17 kilodalton antigen to generate all of this data. Um, zooming in on the data a little bit, I can highlight a few points here. One is that if you have less than 384 antibodies, like in this case it was about 40, um, you can spot them at multiple times. So in this case, we spotted all the antibodies at 8 to 12 replicates, which allows you to generate actual statistics, mean and standard deviations of on and off rate and affinity fit, which is kind of unheard of in SPR previously. It also allows you to do things like mobilize antibodies at different densities, so you can get better kinetic parameters. Um, also, you can see these antibodies weren't spotted right next to each other, so there's very good kinetic agreement across the surface of the array. Also, this approach enables you to do a more optimized approach to the screen, where we have very little sample or time constraints on running these, so we can do broad kinetic series. In this point, it was an Okay, so it was an eight-point titration series starting at one micromolar. And you can see we're able to get really excellent kinetic descriptions over at least a 20,000-fold dynamic range going from high triple-digit nanomolar to double-digit picomolar from the same kinetic series in the same run. Also, the kinetic analysis software tries to prevent users from either reporting bad data or having to spend a huge amount of time uh, triaging out uh, questionable data in the analysis. So it has these automatic QC flags that we say likes to flag the good, the bad, and the ugly. So if that something is a low or non-binder, uh, it's color gray and the rate constants will not be reported in the table. It flags things with poor fit and can also flag things that have kinetic limitations in the assay. You know, if you did not inject a high enough concentration of antigen to accurately estimate the KD, it will flag that for you. Um, or if you have uh, very stable clones that have off rates that are not well described by the amount of time you've collected dissociation, it will flag those as well. So these are all very common problems in SPR literature um, where people have reported erroneous rate constants, or people have to spend a lot of time curating their data to prevent these issues. So we try to automate that as much as possible. So with that, you know, we really view the LSA as sort of a disrupting tool in antibody analytics um, with this unprecedented parallel throughput and minimal sample consumption. It allows you to generate really high quality um, kinetic and epitope binning analysis early in your discovery funnel. So do you think this kind of upstream SPR analysis enables people to, to shorten the timeline for this library to lead triaging steps and, and have, gives you more of the detailed characterization you typically get later on early in your funnel? Um, and high throughput epitope binning can really reveal uh, the epitope landscape quickly and gives you an exquisite resolution that the lower throughput methods just can't enable and allows you to select mechanically dis 
differentiated MOAs. So with that, I want to you know, thank you for uh, listening and stay safe. And also, if you have questions for me about the platform, uh, there's my email address, ebettinger at Cartera Bio or info at carterabio.com. And we also have some more content on YouTube from recent Epstop Gaming and Kinetic Web webinars. So if you're interested in that, just search for Cartera on YouTube platform. You can find that content. So thanks again for listening, and hopefully we still have some time for some questions. The question that I have here, when you decide to express clones from a panning output, how much do you rely on related sequence groups to reduce the number of clones to express and test? To rephrase, how heavily do you think you need to sample out of closely related MAB sequence families on the first pass through screening and characterization? Um, great question. So, you know, I typically uh, work instead of a DNA company, I, you know, I have, uh, I have a lot of uh, ability to make a lot of DNAs. So typically, um, I usually make every clone that comes out of my panning, so I don't typically have to make those decisions. But if I had to, then I, I agree with you. Looking at that sequence uh, phylogeny tree that I showed earlier is a great way to kind of narrow down your sequences. But in general, I, I usually make every single unique clone that comes out of my panning. One other question. Is it necessary to run replicates of samples in kinetics? And how does it change the interpretation results of a panel? Yeah, I always consider the different concentrations of the analyte as a, as a great way to make sure you get a good affinity when you're doing SPR experiments. So typically, I don't run replicates, oftentimes replicates of the antibodies themselves. But again, if we have room on the array, say I'm only running 96, um, I will run replicates of each of the individual antibodies. But if I'm running a, a larger screen where I don't have the capacity on the that single run, then, or I don't have enough antibody itself, um, I'll just do a single a singlet to just get me some initial data. And then, of course, I'll always follow up that with additional uh, replicates to make sure I have a true affinity. All right. And we also do have several more questions that have come in. How do you make a, a and design library starting uh, ion channel and GPCR? So as I said, um, we use a motif direction. We use two approaches. One is a motif direct approach where you, for example, um, collect together all of the motifs that bind GPCRs and ion channels, and then we actually graph that into the heavy chain CR3 loop. Um, the other approach is you basically take all the antibodies that bind that class of targets and use that as a design set to make a library focused on that class. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll answer another one. In the TAL platform, does mouse antibody humanization involve CDRs being also humanized or is it just the framework? Good question. So um, I always say the TAL platform is fantastic for doing humanization because the mouse CDRs actually get replaced with human equivalents. Um, so not only are you humanizing the framework, you're also humanizing CDRs. So it's, uh, so in the end of the day, it actually gives you an antibody that's almost indistinguishable from a fully human antibody. Curious if your VH library has been validated for any intracellular targets. No, it hasn't. Um, I, I don't see why it wouldn't work, but um, we haven't done that. Um, secondly, are your are T cell types removed from the VHH frameworks? We use uh, consensus LAMA frameworks or humanized frameworks. We haven't, uh, good question, we should check them for T cell epitopes, but again, we're just trying to use the most commonly used frameworks throughout. The, the repertoire, but you're, you're right. It's, that's probably a good thing to check. Have you tried to switch frameworks of the hits from the shuffle libraries to see what happens to functionality and affinity? Uh, I haven't, we haven't tried to put them into, as I said, there's kind of two flavors of library, either a consensus llama or humanized framework. Um, and that does have, have an effect in terms of the hits we get. So it does show that um, framework does play a role. Do you start any work on COVID-19? Uh, great question. Uh, actually, yesterday I, I did give a webinar from Twist um, where I talked about uh, uh, that we've done a lot of work finding, trying to find antibodies against S1 and S2. Um, and we have found some antibodies that are potentially inhibitors. So uh, that's something we're actively working on right now. We do have time for just one question. Eliardo asks, how long does it take to acquire data for one sample over the full 384 array? Well, um, I mean, it, it takes about four minutes to load the injection into the loop and flow it. So, I mean, if you were talking about the entire array prep process, it varies based on conditions, but it takes about two hours to build a typical 384 spot array. And then 
um, you know, the injections just take minutes. Um, typically, if we're doing something like a kinetics or epitobinine run, the, the workflow is that, you know, during the day or the afternoon, you set up the array and put all your samples in the instrument and then run the assays overnight. So when you come in the next day, you have a mountain of data that you can process. It's like Christmas. Oh, all right, thank you. We do have one other quick question for you. Are purified antibodies needed for epitope binning? Oh, that's a good question without a really easy answer. So epitope binning assays are complicated enough where if you have purified antibodies, um, they will work easier and give you clear data almost universally. There are cases where if you have, say, XP293 systems, like the expression system that TWIST uses, oftentimes those samples are pure enough and high enough concentration where you can use them as if they were purified, just as supernames and run the binning. There are some approaches that you can use to do classical binning with like uh, other sample types like mouse hybridoma antibodies. But because uh, kinetics and concentration are important parts of that analysis where you're injecting things with analytes, um, you're a bit more constrained on what conditions uh, will, will give you clear data. So it, it's a bit of a mixed answer on that. It is possible. There are definitely techniques to do it, but not all sample sources are readily amenable to that. All right, thank you so much. We have run out of time, so I will be forwarding the other questions we weren't able to address along to our presenters, and you'll receive those answers via email. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Aaron Sato and Dr. Dan Bettinger for presenting today. I'd like to thank the folks at TWIST for sponsoring. So mostly, thank you all so very much for coming today. It's a strange time, and we know you're very busy. And we're glad you chose to spend this time with us. So on behalf of Cambridge Health Tech Institute's Global Web Symposia Series, thank you all again so very much, and have a great day. Bye-bye.